libraries here at the IMU. My name is David Hensley and I'm the executive director of the John Papa John Entrepreneurial Center at the University of Iowa up in the Papa John Business Building. And I, tonight, I think you're going to really enjoy our conversation. Um, we have two recent graduates from the University of Iowa that have decided to become entrepreneurs. And you know, sometimes we bring tech entrepreneurs, sometimes we bring others. This is kind of an interesting story because early in their business, they were forced to try to figure out, okay, how do we take a business that is an in-person business, and if we want to stay in business, actually continue our work when the, when the country was shut down during COVID. So we're gonna get into that. Um, the format of this is I'm gonna ask them several questions. And then at some point, I will open it up to the audience for you to ask questions. I please, um, they came here and part of the fun is to hear questions from you, what you're wanting to listen and learn from. I do ask that if you have computers and phones, you put them away. Uh, we want you to be listening and paying attention to our, our guest speakers. Again, these are uh, dance graduates from the University of Iowa. We've got Annika Harvey and Amanda Gustafson, so let's give them a great big Hawkeye welcome. And actually, you are seeing the best of the best from Southwest Iowa, because we realize that we're all from where, where I grew up and where they grew up, we're all about 20 minutes or so. So it's rare on a campus like this, you're gonna see three people from Southwest Iowa. So welcome ladies. Why don't you, let's start with telling a little bit about where you grew up, um, how you got introduced to dance, and what brought you to the University of Iowa. Okay, so I'm Annika. Um, I grew up my whole life dancing um, in a dance studio. I really admired my dance teacher growing up, and I knew at a really young age, once I got past nine and wanted to quit dance, that uh, I wanted to open a dance studio. And um, I knew Iowa had a really great dance program, and that is where I went. Very similar story. I've been dancing forever. I, my dance teacher was like my second mom. I, did, I wanted to do everything in the studio that she was doing. Um, it was super fun to me, and I, I had my freshman year where I was like, I think I'm going to quit dance, and I'm going to pursue a business career, um, and then I came back, and here we are. So tell them a little bit about Corning and Elkhorn. So I, I, it's always nice for people to get an understanding of the town you actually grew up from and what you got to experience when you were in high school. Yeah, so Elkhorn is a town of 700 and slowly... Not, not 700 anymore, uh, more like 500. I graduated with 18 people in my class. Um, I knew everybody's name, I knew their birthday, I knew their parents, I knew their cell phone numbers by heart. And so it was just a small, really small town environment, small dance studio, and then we ended up in the big city of Des Moines. Yeah, and Corning's very similar, but we're a lot bigger. We have 1,500 people in our town. Um, and I graduated with 30 people in my class. So a lot more people than Elkhorn, um, but nothing like the University of Iowa or Iowa City or Waukee where we're at now. Um, definitely small town turned big city. So you were here in Iowa and you were dancing and then how did the, tell the story of how the two of you met and decided to um, start. And notice how, it's in always interesting when you have, you're interviewing two people, how they move the microphone around and who's <laughs> answering what. So. Um, talk a little bit about how the two of you met and decided to go into a partnership. Yeah, so dance is a small world. We were both from small towns. We knew of each other growing up. Um, we competed against each other. I didn't know her personally. Um, and then we both... There was a rivalry. There was a little bit of a rivalry um, between our teachers and therefore us. Um, and then we both ended up in a ballet class together one day. And I was like, oh, are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> here she was. And here we are. We had a few conversations about oh, I wanna open a dance studio somewhere in Des Moines. Oh, so do I. And I was like, we need to do this together. I think it will be so much better, so much easier. Oh, you wanna tell the rest? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so then she presented this idea to me and me being the competitive person I am, I was like, hell no, I'm not going to join you. Um, I'm not going to run a business with you. I want to do exactly what I wanna do. I don't want you to tell me what to do. Um, and so she is very persuasive and um, sat me down. We went to Java House one day and she wrote on a napkin, like the pros and the cons of us opening a business together. And after she presented it the way she did, I decided, okay, maybe you're right. 
which happens a lot. Um, and we decided that joining forces, we could open a bigger and better business together. Would you like to have any rebuttal to that, or is that a fair? Okay, that was good. Okay. Um, so while you're here, can you talk a little bit about what you did at Iowa to prepare for, you know, the, the writing a plan or studying? What did you do to try to help you get ready for graduation and your big move to start your business? Yeah. So um, we both were in the dance department, and we're getting our major in dance, um, and then also studying business at the same time. We were also involved in JPEC um, through the Founders Club, and we would go to those weekly lunches on Friday or something where we got free pizza. Um, and we would listen to people speak, and it was super great to hear about other people's experience in business. And then we were also connected with a mentor through that program um, and got hooked up with Leslie Nolte, and she was really great at helping us um, and kind of guiding us in the right direction. But then we really took the reins on our new business the last year we were in school. I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, so I'm one year older than Annika, and I was um, here, and I was like, all right, I've got to go, so you can finish school one year early. You need to finish school one year early if you're going to come with me. So she did. Um, I spent my senior year not taking a whole lot of classes and doing a lot of business stuff. She spent her last year, year here doing a lot of classes to so we could go. Um, and then we, grad we, went, we went to graduation. We drove to Des Moines. We opened the studio in one week, and we were there. So that's pretty impressive, by the way, to be able to do something like that. So you knew it was going to be in Des Moines. One of the big challenges when you're starting a business is location. Uh, Des Moines is a pretty big community, much bigger than where you're from. How did you set upon where your initial location was? And can you talk a little bit about going from, I've got a plan, and now we're actually got to go get a, find a place, get a space, renovate the space, and be ready to open. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Amanda initially said, I want to start a dance studio over by Jordan Creek Mall. And I, I knew she's a little bit prissy. I was like, yeah, that's not, really, that's not really my side of town. I think let's try Bondurant. It's a little, a little more rural. I was like, That'll be, that's where we need to go. So we got hooked up with a real estate agent. Um, and being as naive as we are, we reached out to somebody who sells like houses. <laughs> and so we sat down with him and he was happy to help, got us connected um, and started looking for some commercial properties. And he said, girls, hate to break it to you, there's nothing in Bondurant. And I was like, dang, that really stinks. Um, he said, have you thought about West Des Moines or the Waukee area? And we were like, yeah, we talked about that. And I was like, yeah, that's not really my, that's not really my thing. And he said, well, I have this one property. And the first one he gave us, um, we just said yes to. And we, yeah, we just said yes. We didn't know a ton about it. They shared like some info in the little packet they gave us. And we just believed everything that was on the sheet. And it sounded great. It looked great. And signed the dotted line. And he said, oh, by the way, do you have a business plan? And we said, yes, we will have that to you tomorrow. And so we stayed up all night long <laughs> and wrote a business plan, sent it off to the real estate agent, um, just so he knew we were legit. And we kind of went from there. Do you want to talk about like getting Yeah, so I drove back and forth from Des Moines to Iowa City a lot my senior year. Um, it was a bill to suit, so when we signed the lease, there was nothing there. We got to pretty much design it how we wanted to. Um, we had a TI allowance, and it was it was meant to be. It was dream come true, and we just we just went from there. So some people may not be familiar with build a suite or that allowance. You're, can you talk a little bit about what that means? You know, I think most people understand the concept of there's a space, I rent that space, and then I do it. But talk a little bit about that was a little bit different than actually taking a space and just remodeling it. Yeah, and it was definitely the first time I had ever heard of something like that. And the way I heard about it was through interviewing other studio owners, and they said, oh, we did this build to suite, uh, build to suit option, and it was really great for us. So that's really what we were looking for, and we told the real estate agent that's what we're looking for, um, just so we didn't have to come up with the capital up front. And with that, they just give you like a chunk of money, ours was like $100,000, and they say you can design the inside of the building however you want, and then they work that into your rent. So it works out really great for you because you don't have to come up with the capital up front, um, but you do eventually pay it. So let's talk, about, since you mentioned money, talk a little bit, what did it take 
and how did you get early on? Because it still takes money to pay the bills, pay the electricity, um, do marketing, etc. So how did you finance the business? Yeah. Well, I'll let you talk. About yeah. So I we were talking about it, and we were going to go to a traditional bank, and I was going to go ask my grandparents to co-sign the loan, and my grandpa said, "I will be your bank," and he gave us a thirty thousand dollar loan. We paid it back in a year, and that that was it. But it is kind of funny because we initially went and we were like, can we have 75,000? And he was like, absolutely not. Um, why don't you try 30? And so it was great that he kind of put us in line because I feel like we could have gotten into a lot of trouble if we went to a bank and just said, give us 75 and we'll go with that. Um, and then the other thing that I just wanted to mention is, I don't know if this is typical, but the um, landlord for the property never asked for like our financing. So he had no clue if we had money, um, but yeah, we didn't at that point. We just signed the line and told him, yeah, we'll pay it. Um, so anyway, that kind of worked out in our favor as well. And for, for you know, we've, I've been involved in several businesses. That is not the norm. Uh, <laughs> normally you have to provide all sorts of financial statements, personal financial statements, business plan. You're signing your life away in essence. Um, now they're asking for personal guarantees. So you were very fortunate to have such a, a, I will a nice, tell you, nice landlord. I will tell you this though. He did say, um, well, I guess he didn't say, but the broker who was working with us said it was one of the best business plans he had ever, ever seen. And later, we're really close with our landlord now. Um, and later we asked him, we were like, you never asked us for anything. And he said, yeah, I just really believed in you girls and your business plan was so strong. Um, I knew you had no money. And we were like, okay, great. <laughs> so, so you write a good business plan and just you know, and find the landlord that will will pay for all of your renovations. That that's the message here. So it might take you a while to find those people. Okay, so let's talk now. So you've got the building, you've got it renovated. How'd you get your first dancer? Her first student. We just put out a website. We put out some marketing. Um, we mailed some postcards. Um, <laughs> We put a sign up early on, like just a really cheap sign you just set up next to the building. It was $600 at the time and we didn't have any money. It was not cheap to us at the time. Um, and I think that that just drew a lot of attention. Um, it's, our location is great. We're on a main road where people are driving to school, they're driving to their house. Um, and I attribute a lot of our success to our location. So we put the sign up and we turned all of our marketing on, we turned our website on, we turned our registration system on all at the same time and it just worked out in our favor. Why'd you come up with a name? Good question. Um, I can't tell you exactly. We were just on the stair steppers at the rec um, and we were just throwing ideas back and forth and that's the one that stuck. Really? Yeah. <laughs> So go to the rec, so, and, and I'll tell you something. One of the things is working with startups all the time. You'll see their business names and you're scratching your head going, I do not understand why you're doing So clearly those people did not go to the rec and get on a stair step. So again, another message. You wouldn't have known if you wouldn't have come tonight to that that's where you find your business name is at the, on a Stairmaster at the recreation facility. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about at the beginning, what kind of classes, um, and, and I assume at the beginning it was primarily the two of you doing that. So let's talk a little bit of what it looked like at the beginning, and then when you had to start hiring instructors, what was that like? Mm -hmm. So our first facility that we had, that we were renting, had two studio rooms, and there were two of us. So it worked out perfectly. We hired a mom who was like, I will work at the front desk for you. We were like, this is great. And we taught every single night, and then worked on the business outside of that. I don't know if we slept ever. Um, it was a lot of work, and then, going into the next was it right away that next season mm -hmm. um we had what is called right of first right of refusal on the space next door and they said girls this is the time you need to decide if you want the space next door or if we can rent it out to somebody else and we said you know what we'll take the space next door let's knock the wall down we added a third studio so we knew okay it's time for us to hire there's only two of us we need to fill three studios every night so we started hiring um and to be honest, when you're a new business and people don't know you very well, it's hard to get people. Especially good talent. Um, and so I just remember Facebook messaging everybody I knew, saying, do you know anyone who teaches dance or knows how to dance or teaches preschool or knows anything about kids? I can teach them how to teach dance. <laughs> just send them to me. Um, and I just remember Facebook messaging everyone. And that's before I learned about Indeed, but use that too. That's great, we use that now. So. 
on your first, how, how successful were you? Did, were you able to get good people that have stuck or did you have to have a little bit of churn? We, we had a lot of churn. Um, I think we have one, two. We have two, two. employees from our two. second year. Um, but since then we've acquired a lot of a lot of great employees that when we're really happy with our team where we are now. I was gonna add one point to Annika's story. Um, in the first season, she approached me and said, Amanda, I can't work as much as I'm working. I'm gonna go get a job at Athleta because we make no money. I was like, okay, give me six months. Please come to work at the dance studio. Give me six months. Um, and she did. And I think that's just an important point in the story of we buckled down, we gave it our all, we lived together, we paid nothing in rent, we didn't do anything fun, um, and we just we just did it for the first year. And I thought we were rolling. Yeah. yeah, coming out of college, you're young and naive, and you don't need a whole lot. So, so can you tell a little bit about the roles that each one of you played? I mean, I know you were both doing dance instruction, but. From a business perspective, did you kind of split the, the duties? Okay, so this is also so beneficial, especially if you have ever considered a partnership or want to go into a partnership. We showed up every single day at 9 a.m. at a dance studio that runs till 9 p.m., so that's super early. And we would sit there at the desk and we would just kind of stare at each other, say, okay, so what are we gonna do today? And we would like make a list and then we would tackle it together. So if it was like plan the recital, we would just sit there and work together to plan the recital. Um, and it took us about two years, three, three years. <laughs> um, and we were like, you know what? We are fighting all the time and we are like clawing each other's eyes out. And like both of us do not need to be working on these projects all the time. It's causing more conflict than it is necessary. What if we divided things up? And I was like, yes, great. You call the school, I'll get the t-shirts. And she was like, no, no, no. She was like, like areas of the business. Like you do finance and I'll do marketing. I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's really scary. I don't know if I want to give you that. Like I still wanted to have my hands in it. And anyway, we decided, I was like, let's just try it. We'll try it for a couple months, see how it goes. Worked really well. Um, the fights got fewer and we got way more productive. We got way more productive. We do um, a, a lot more now, the way we have it set up. So right now, I'm handling all of the finance in the business and then our employees, so I kind of act as our HR department. Um, and then I handle the recreational side of things in our recital. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Big ones. And then I handle all of the marketing, um, our competition program, our performance team, and other small programs like that. And so it's been really great. Um, way less conflict, way more productivity. Um, I would highly recommend. Start that way. And I think when we talked the other day, you talked about master or masterminds, right? Did you talk a little bit about what that is and that, how that's really helped you from a business uh, leadership perspective? Yeah, so like she was saying, we would come to work and we'd sit there and look at each other and be like, what are we supposed to do today? There was no textbook. There was no teacher telling us like, okay, you need to do this now. Um, so it was in uh, our second season that we joined something called the Inner Circle. Um, it's for dance studio owners all over the world, and they give you a really great groundwork of here's the things you need to do in your business. Um, it's pricey, but it's extremely valuable to our business um, to have coaches and to have perspectives of other dance studios all over the world, and it's something that we highly suggest. Yeah, and I just want to add to that. There's a lot of people who I feel wait to join masterminds until they're making money, um, which, I mean, we... We were always profitable when we opened, which we're very lucky for. Um, but me being the conservative person I was, I told Amanda when she came to me with this idea to join this mastery group, I said, you know what? I just don't really think like the funds are there. I would rather throw it in a savings account. This seems silly. We're not gonna do this. And she said, just try it like she always does. And then she tried to convince me and I decided, yes, let's do it. Um, and the really great thing about the mastery group is we were able to build our business from the start correctly, whereas there's a lot of people in our mastery group who have already built a business and have to go back and correct things. So we were setting up systems and processes and setting our pricing, setting our pricing correctly. And there's a lot of those changes that aren't so easy to make once your business is up and running um, because those pricing changes are really hard for your clients. And then bringing systems in and getting your employees to follow systems, that's really hard when they haven't done it before. Um, following rules, all of those things. 
So that's, you brought up a good point about pricing. A lot of times um, when you see young entrepreneurs or first time entrepreneurs, they feel like they have to be the cheapest on the block. Uh, and that that's how they're gonna compete is to be the lowest priced option. Can you talk a little bit about how you set prices and how and where you are today from a standpoint of the, the price compared to your competitors? Yeah, so we came in, um, did our research on the dance studios in a five mile radius of us. Um, then we did our research on every dance studio in the Des Moines Metro, Metro all the pricing we could find. Um, we had heard enough about price yourselves either at the same point or higher. Did we go at the same? No, we went higher. We went higher. We went higher right when we came in. Um, and I think that that helped us for the better. We had a brand new building. Um, recent graduates were young and I think that it was it was the best choice for us how did the local market um, react to you when you got there I mean you know there was existing dance studios and programs um, so what was that like and, and how did you you know create your your niche and your and your and build your business yeah I really think location was everything um, it it just really was so there's a lot of neighborhoods around our studio and it's strictly residential on the other side of the street but when you cross the street it turns commercial um, and so as soon as they leave their house we're the first dance studio they drive by most of the time and so we're the name they're seeing all the time and i know a lot of people in our community who wouldn't drive a mile two miles down the road because it's less convenient so i really do think location was everything and everyone accepted us really well i feel like in the Waukee community we love it there and the families have been great yeah. So you're in business about two years and you wake up one morning and there's an announcement that the United States um, is being shut down. Uh, this was COVID about March of 20, and it was literally the middle of March and, and you, every business owner in this country turned on the radio or tel turned on the television and said, oh, by the way, lock your doors. Nobody can come in and we're all gonna sit inside. Kind of hard to teach dance lessons when you're doors are locked and and at that point nobody for those of you you know most of you were in school somewhere maybe in high school never really thought about what it meant to business but you know when you're told all of us you have plans you have bills you have employees etc and then the government tells you to stop you cannot conduct business and it really at the time we weren't sure how long this was gonna be. I mean, COVID, it was just all of a sudden, this COVID thing you gotta take seriously, so we're shutting everything down. Um, and there really was not a directive to say, oh, this is gonna be two weeks, this is gonna be four weeks. Um, we weren't really sure. And every state, as you all know, as you lived it, had a completely different approach um, to COVID. So can you talk a little bit about what that was like when all of a sudden your business is starting to roll and then boom, COVID hits and you've gotta figure out what to do? Yeah, so I'm definitely pessimistic. And I was on spring break, Amanda was at home, and I called her and I was like, we are ruined. Our whole life is ruined, everything is ruined, we are going to lose everything, we are all going to die. <laughs> and she said, you know what, why don't you get on a plane and come home? I was like, okay, <laughs> sounds good. So I hopped on a plane and we came home and we just started brainstorming. And again, um, this is about the same time we joined that mastery group and they gave us a lot of helpful feedback to kind of navigate the whole situation. Yeah, so we turned our business online. Nobody liked it. We did it for the least amount of time we possibly could. Um, I, I want to say it was like six to eight weeks that we did Zoom classes and then we recorded stuff and put that in iMovie and sent it out and we tried all the things. Y you can't run a dance studio online. We figured that out. Um, and then we came back as soon as we could with the six foot squares and the no parents in the lobby. And that was a challenge because you're trying to get a two year old who has no idea they're supposed to go to the next class to the next class. Um, and it was this, it was our third season. We both had COVID at the very start of our third season with a brand new staff, um, and we couldn't be there. So we not only had subs, we had a brand new staff. We sat at home, we watched our security cameras. Um, and so it, it, it was all just a learning experience and we could only just take everything day by day, do as best as we could and keep fighting the fight. And I think that's really the moment where I learned the pivot thing that they always talk about. They're like, oh, if that doesn't work, pivot. I was like, okay, for real, that's silly. Um, but it's true. There's a lot of options um, and that goes for everything in your business in terms of finding financing, in terms of keeping it running when there's a pandemic, in terms of like anything that could go your way. It is so, it's not easy, 
um, but it's so doable to pivot. You can always find a solution. There is always a solution out there. And I think that's really the moment my mind changed um, because before, like I am a black and white person. I was like, well, we're done. This is over. And uh, it, it wasn't. <laughs> So you must be pretty good um, convincer to, to keep her <laughs> from going off the edge over it seems like many, many times. So how did you convince the, the parents? Or, or was it the parents just wanted to get their kids out of the house? And so they were comfortable going to taking their kids to the studio? Yeah, so a lot of advice we got was pick, pick your side, do that, you'll find your clientele. So we took our side, we came back. Um, we did still offer Zoom classes for anybody who didn't feel comfortable coming back to the studio. Um, so we had most of our kids in the studio. We had a handful of kids on Zoom um, and we just tried to take a stance and then meet our current clientele where, where they were at. And that seemed to be the most successful way for us to go about it. Yeah, and I think that's where we also learned there were a lot of times during COVID where we would like make a decision and change our mind and then make a decision and change our mind. And eventually we realized there's no point in doing that because at the end of the day, half of the people will be mad at you and half of the people will love you. And so um, we really also learned to just trust our gut. And I think our families really respected that. And they knew that whatever we put out, eventually we figured it out. Um, that we were trusting our gut and ultimately like decisions were in their hands. Um, but I think that they trusted that we knew what we were doing and um, I don't know, I think they were happy with it. Now is the, and again, I'm not into the dance world, so, and I didn't have, uh, my kids didn't do it. Is it spring kind of like when you have a big event, some type, a recital or whatnot? And this would have been right at the time COVID hit. So what did that do to your recital plans? Yeah, so we got real lucky. A lot of studios were like, cancel the recital, do all the things. And I told them, and I was like, we really need the recital money. So let's figure it out. We got to figure out how we're going to do this um, because it's essential for our business survival. And we got so lucky because our recital fell right in that gap between like, we didn't really know what COVID was or like how, how big of a deal it was. So like we were able to go back in person, um, but there were limited restrictions and we had a recital. And the only person who would rent out to us was the Sherrison Hotel. So we rented their bar ballroom out and we um, set a stage up and it was not the most pretty recital you've ever seen in your life. Um, but we would shuffle the kids in, they would do their thing and then they would leave and it was great. And I think for our families, even though it wasn't the prettiest thing, I think they were very appreciative that we got something done and um, that all of their students' hard work from the entire year was able to be showcased. And I think when, when we were chatting, you talked about that you were actually able to grow the business during the COVID time. And before you respond to that, you know, one of the things in business is when th things are tough, whether it's a recession, you know, we have these um, shocks to the system that a lot of businesses are just trying to hold on and they really kind of go into cocoon mode or they stop innovating. And, and that's really can be a great opportunity for the competition to say, hey, they're not really being aggressive. Now we can go grab market share. So, you know, one of the things we always try to teach in our program is you want to have cash. You want to have be ready for when opportunity presents itself. And while you might not think COVID necessarily was an opportunity for, for some businesses, but if you're thinking entrepreneurially, it could be a very successful time because nobody else is paying. You know, they're just trying to hold on. So talk a little bit about how you were able to leverage um, that opportunity and, and continue to grow the business yeah i think with that time with the studio being shut down we were able to learn a lot about marketing and amanda really worked on the back end of our marketing and getting automation set up and facebook ads and all of the things online and our enrollments just rolled in during covid and it was very surprising to us because we were expecting a huge dip and all the studios in our group were like yep we're we're hitting the dip we're losing students um, and I also think part of that was because we were in person a lot of the time. We were only online for six weeks. Um, parents really appreciated that as well. So growing the business and then you're getting too big for your facility. Here we go again. Now, can you talk a little bit about realizing our studio is not big enough? Now we have to take another leap. <laughs> our studio probably wasn't ever big enough. Um, so we were in our second, third season. 
probably, it was about two years ago, um, we started exploring the idea. Our landlord owned a two acre piece of land, kitty corner to where we were at. Um, and we had kind of always joked that eventually we'll take that, eventually we'll buy it from you, eventually we'll build a dance studio over there, save it for us. Um, and he came up to us and said, hey, well, I will finance this whole project for you if you want to move over there. Um, he really just wanted us out of the building because everyone complained about the noise. <laughs> Part, partly that, and I think he wanted to sell his land. Um, and so we bought the two eight, well, we're financing through him. Um, he built the building for us and we moved from 4,000 square feet to 12,000 square feet just five weeks ago. It's been great, it's been blooming. We have 650 kids now. We've grown by about 200 kids this season. Um, and it's been awesome. So, you know, did you, did you hear that again? She got a land a, a landowner to finance it and build. You need to write a book on how you did <laughs> that really because crazy. he must be, well, he's either loaded and he's just a really gent nice person or you two are the greatest negotiators uh, on the planet because again, that is not a normal situation in most, in, most situ in most businesses. But with that being said, I think you can still find ways. Um, I think so often I've always been so glued to traditional financing and traditional things, but there's so many other options. So even though like he's kind of a unicorn of a landlord, there's so many options out there. But I think it's probably safe to say, you know, you were paying your bills, you've been a good tenant, you're bubbly and exciting and the business is growing. And a lot of times you can find people that they want to invest in you, right? They say, hey, these two people are people that I can get, I can get behind and they're winners and they're gonna make things happen and so I wanna help, you know, and so I think that's part of it too. You know, the way you treat your vendors, the way you treat your suppliers, the way you treat your landlords, the way you treat your customers and employees makes a huge difference and when you need something or there's an opportunity, most people I've found in business will, will help if, you're, if you act and behave in the right manner. Would you agree with that? I would definitely agree with that, um, yeah. So let's talk now. I want to. We're we're getting close to the time where we're going to open it up for questions from all of you. So start thinking of your great questions. So let's talk a little bit about when you went home while you were in college. Let's go back a little bit and you're talking to your folks. What they think of this idea of you guys starting a business? Um, it was just it was what it was always going to be. Um, I said I've said that since I think I was ten. Um, and so any other option would have been something strange. I don't think my parents or my family was like, no, don't do that, what are you doing? But I also don't think they thought it was gonna turn into what it turned into as quickly as it did. Um, they knew I was a go-getter, they knew I was a doer, and that's what we went in. We just went in and just did it, so. So let's talk now a little bit about, so the business got new location, growing, what's next? Um, good question. I would say right now we are looking to really grow our competitive program. Um, we've both been teaching that since the beginning of time. And so I think we're looking for some teachers to bring into that area of it and develop that program a little bit more um, now that our rec site is really growing and those teachers are super great. Um, bring more kids in, fill this building, and then we've got some things up our sleeve for after that. Do you see having the, just the one studio in Des Moines, or do you have aspirations to have more location? You know, I'm sure there's opportunity yeah. in Elkhorn or Corning. You know? mm, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> uh, I, we've thrown some ideas around. I think there's a lot of ideas out there. Typically, what we've seen is multiple locations doesn't work super well, um, unless you're very strategic about it. I'm sure some people do it very well. Um, but a lot of what we've heard is that's not necessarily the way to go. Um, we do have one idea where like we would do possibly like some sort of little satellite thing, um, but it wouldn't be a full blown dance studio. And then I would say in terms of the business, um, just building our current location is big to us and our programming. We have a lot of programming this year. We change all the time. I'm sure if you have an entrepreneurial mind, you juggle ideas all the time and this year, we told our staff, we said it's a year of settle. We promise we won't have any new ideas or any new programs until we do. But we promise and we'll try not to. Um, and so they really enjoyed that. So right now we're kind of settling into the new building, hopefully not coming up with any new programs this year. 
Um, but as we head into future years, definitely more programming at the studio. So when I went out to their website, I looked at their program schedule for October. And I, I you know, you, I'm not in, in, into this business at all, right? But so I thought, okay, I'll just kind of check. And literally every day, it's just like, you know, every half hour, there's multiple classes going on. And so, you know, realize this is a big operation to run and to make sure, you know, if it's, you know, if an instructor gets sick or can't be there or something happens, I mean, you've got, you've got kids coming in and out of there on a regular basis. So I assumed now, and you guys are still, uh, still doing training, correct? Yeah. Um, another thing that we're really focusing on this year is we're, we're very much so in the doing of our business still, and we would like to step away from that and let the reins go a little bit, let our staff take some things on so we can sit at a bird's eye view of where this business needs to go. Um, and so, yes, we're trying to get out of the teaching side of it. We're trying to get out of the doing side of it. We're really trying to step into the CEO side of our business, but not out of it. But not out of it. Just less, less just business. less, um, so that we can have the brain space to oversee and to think and to vision plan um, as we move forward. Still working incredibly long hours? Yeah, I think yesterday I worked a 12 hour day um, at the studio. So that's pretty typical, I would say. Um, something that has been the best treat for me anyway is um, we've had our Saturdays and Sundays off. So we haven't had that since we opened the business and it's been great until we hit competition season and then that's a whole nother story. But right now we have Saturdays and Sundays off. And honestly, I feel like I've come up with so many more ideas because I've had a second to breathe and think um, and not be so into the tasks of the business. It's funny you say that because the majority of you that are going to go to work for someone, um, you, you could just assume you're going to have um, Saturdays and Sundays off. But when you're an entrepreneur, it's... 724 right i mean you don't have that um that luxury because you are you are the business and if you're not there and you're not building this thing it can really it can you know turn on a dime right whether it's mistakes you make or the economy changes or competitors change and so it can be exhausting so how do you keep the energy level up celsius if you've ever had <laughs> celsius big celsius fan the green tea kind um, I told Amanda last night, I said, I've had two of these. I said, I've never felt better. This is so great. Um, so yes, caffeine, but I think in all reality, at least for me, it's um, just stepping back. And I really have to step back. She's, she's a workaholic. She would work all day long. It's very different. But for me, it's like being able to step back and appreciate what we've built. Um, and so I'm not even kidding. Like having Saturday and Sunday off lets me do that. Whereas when I'm in the business, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the most draining thing. Um, and it's so hard for me to appreciate what we've built, but when I have time to like look at it and just be like, wow, this thing that we've created together is amazing. And I'm so thankful for the flexibility we have and, um, the control we have over our own lives. Like we're in charge of how much money we make. We're in charge of when we work, we're in charge of all of these things that I wouldn't get if I would have just gotten a job out of school. Um, and so there's so much appreciation, I think for what we do and it's just being able to step back for me and find that. What about you, workaholic you? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I do step back sometimes, but I think for me it's definitely the like uh, the vision of the future, the vision of the future. I'm always thinking like, what's gonna happen in five years? Where are we gonna be in 10 years? What's the next thing we're gonna do? How are we going to accomplish this? And I just love putting those puzzle pieces together, thinking of those ideas. And so the more I can do that um, and the less emails I can write, the more energized I feel. So do you find yourself, given the way that you work, do you find yourself on Saturdays and Sundays thinking more about the business or are you able to break away? No, I do it all the time, um, unless on the off chance I'm here in Iowa City at a football game on a Saturday. Um, I'm pretty much working every other day and at this point in my life, um, we've also talked about there's just seasons and we don't have kids and it's, it's the season right now that I like what I'm doing and I wouldn't have it any other way. So... Um... As, as you say that, describe the, a great day for you in your business. Interesting. Um, a great day in our business. And you know what's coming next. No, I don't. The other side of it. Oh, the worst day. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, I would just say a great day in our business is when I get to work with the students that I really enjoy teaching. Um, and then I also think like being able to sit back and evaluate our like KPIs for the business and just see like, oh my gosh, we've 
doubled this or doubled this and like this is going up and our students are growing, um, that would be a great day for me. Yeah, I can echo that. I love um, getting on strategy calls with our coaches from our mastery group and talking through issues that we're having um, and doing those big picture items. It's really fun for me to do that. So let's, rather than say worst, what's been the toughest thing? Partnership. Partnership is the toughest thing. Um, it's it's you, been a- You didn't, you had that answer ready to go. Yeah, we I talk mean. about it all the time. Um, it's been a blessing. It's been an absolute blessing. Um, but at the same time, it, it's, it's harder than my marriage. Um, and so we're together all the time. We are both type A people. I want to do it. She wants to do it. We fight over who does it. Um, rather than like we're fighting because somebody's not pulling their weight. That is never the issue with us. Um, and so partnership. Yes, partnership for sure. Um, there are some rough days, and there's days where we fight for hours on end. Um, yeah, those are exhausting. Those days are exhausting, but it's so worth it. So I just want to throw out there, if you need partnership advice or you're thinking about it, I would love to talk to you because we have so much experience. We've hired life coaches. We've gone to a marriage counselor on accident. We've done a lot of things. <laughs> so. We have a lot of knowledge in terms of partnership and how to make it work. Um, and I just feel like we kind of set it up well from the beginning um, because we have very similar values. But I think you would say also, it's boy, it's nice to have somebody when things are tough to be able to bounce ideas yeah. off and know somebody's got your back. Yes, and we blame each other all the time. It's so great when the mom comes in and she's so mad. I just say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I would have to talk to Amanda. Um, I'll have to talk to a man about it. Definitely not my lane. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so it's really great. You can blame somebody. And um, I do think entrepreneurship is lonely. Um, it's very lonely and it's great to have somebody there. And I know that she'll always have my back and I'll always have her back. And it's just really nice. All right. So now I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Again, you feel free to ask any question you like about running a business or anything like that. So. Who would like to be first? Don't be shy. Go, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm curious how you guys chose Waukee, because I know it's a pretty saturated market, especially in Des Moines. Um, and how, yeah, like, did you decide that you had something different just because you guys are young? Um, yes. So it is saturated. There are probably three studios within two miles of us. Um, but I think the biggest thing is I know deep down, and mostly she knows, that we will work harder than any other studio owner around us. Day in, day out, I will outwork them any day. Um, and so I'm not scared of them. And like, also there's so many kids in Waukee that like every dance studio offers something different and what we offer appeals to a certain clientele and the studio down the road has a very different clientele and there's plenty of kids to go around. Um, so I would just say plethora of kids and then just knowing that at the end of the day, we will outwork anybody. I will just add to that. Um, we got told a lot in college, what's your, what makes you guys unique? What makes you guys unique? And we're like, I don't know. We are a dance studio. We're going to go in and we're going to teach dance. And five years later, looking back on it, I think what makes us unique is that, um, we took what everybody is doing and we just did it a little bit better. And that's pretty typical in a lot of businesses, is you're just better than the competition. We got questions over here. Yeah. So you can see them. Uh, did you guys ever like second guess yourself? And if you did, like what made you like, um, like keep going? Like, no, this is it. This, it, this will Can work out. That? No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so I definitely second guessed myself. Um, not not necessarily the business, but maybe the partnership. Uh, there was a time where I told Amanda, I said, well, I don't even know if I want to do this my whole life. So, or whatever. And I mean, that was a huge conflict. But for me, it was like the exhaustion. I had just gotten so exhausted. Um, and so I felt that way for a while. And that was a conflict between us because we were planning for the future. And she's like, well, you don't even know if you want to do it forever. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Um, but eventually, like when I was able to step back, like I said, and find that appreciation for what we built. And when I noticed like, oh, this is actually something um, that was really valuable for me. 
Um, I will also say finding what you can get from your business is really important. I know so many entrepreneurs who don't pay themselves. They don't um, give themselves the time off that they need. No boundaries around their business and you have to set those things in order to appreciate it and not resent your business. So I would say that was the biggest thing for me. What about you, Amanda? There hasn't been a whole lot of second guessing the big decision. Um, I do think I second guess the little decisions I make all the time and over the years that's that's exhausting when you're making 30,000 decisions a day. Um, and so we've gotten very good at just trusting our gut, making a decision and moving forward. So kind of two questions. One, what do you guys project as like your capacity for the current uh, building you're in now of like, oh, I have to expand now because the amount of kids we have is over this threshold. And second, what are your guys' leading KPIs? Like you said, you enjoy reviewing those. So like, what are the most important? Nope. We'll start with um, I think it's, it's hard to say. I think there's a lot of shifting and a lot of moving and a lot of adding that we can do within our current facility. But I would say when we're around 800 to 900 students, we would start looking at an expansion plan. Yes, for sure. And then in terms of KPIs, there's a lot. So um, with the finance side, I'm obviously always tracking revenue, always tracking expenses, always tracking net profit. My favorite one is like um, our payroll percentage of revenue, payroll percentage of expenses, um, trying to think, I love tracking profit for, per program. So like the revenue that comes in for that program versus what the teachers are paying versus the expenses we're paying for the program, is it profitable um, or do we need to cut it? Because that's saved us a lot of times where we've had unprofitable programs and we're like, you know what, birthday parties aren't cutting it, get rid of them. Um, because it's just not worth the time. And so that saved us a lot. And then Amanda has a whole sheet of marketing and enrollment KPIs that she tracks. Yep, I just, I mean, I track the marketing side of it. So the students we have, the revenue we're bringing in from those students, what that equates to per student. Um, I do a lot of social media KPIs, website KPIs. Um, yeah. I would just say KPIs are, I didn't realize this, but the most important thing in your business because there are things or trends that are happening in our business where if we don't track them soon enough, we will go under because we, we were just blind to it. Whereas right now I feel like, oh, okay, well, that pro that's not making money, that needs to go. Or um, our revenue per student is going down drastically, something's wrong. Like something's wrong, our teachers aren't doing well, um, our class times aren't great, we have to figure out what it is. And we do a lot of surveying as well of our clients and that's very helpful. Hi, um, what are some of the like pros and cons that you've had about moving or like having a different business like in another location? Um, so we got very lucky with our current situation. The parking lots are literally connected. Um, and so we did a big social media reveal of like we have a really exciting announcement coming and everybody was like, you're moving. Where are you moving to? How much farther am I gonna have to drive to dance? Um, they kind of figured it out. We waited a while, we announced that it was just gonna be around the corner um, and so it was great. I think we would have lost a lot of clientele if we would have moved even five minutes down the road. Um, and so I think we got very lucky within that and if you're ever considering moving or making that change, I would just be careful of what your clients want. Um, be cautious. I, wouldn't, I just wouldn't say there haven't been a lot of cons with our location. Honestly, that has been the greatest blessing for our business. I have a few, but they're pretty short, so I've danced for a long time, so um, this kind of was really um, insightful to me, and I enjoyed that you guys came here, so thank you for that. Um, so the first question I had was, did you guys both have competition at your home studios, like when you first started dance? We did. Um, it looks very different from what our competition team looks like. I think it's everything that we dreamed we could have had that we didn't have. At one point, I was the competition team. I was the only person who did anything. Um, and so I do think a lot of the drive behind what we do comes from the fact that we grew up in such small studios and there was so much want that we just couldn't have in our small town. And then did you guys have competition at your studio the first year you opened? We did. We had a team of nine. I think it was eight. 
eight or nine. We're up to 41 now, so growing, um, but slowly. And then you guys mentioned that your typical work day is like nine to nine per se. Do you guys have classes that early? How do you navigate that with students in school and stuff? We do a couple days of a fine arts club preschool. Um, so that runs, we don't teach morning classes anymore. We used to. Um, and then we do one day of preschool dance classes in the mornings. But we do most of our business focused work in the like mornings. And then we start teaching around three. And then my last one was like, how do you guys navigate how much each of you get paid? And then like, does your grandpa have any ownership of the business or anything like that? These are tough questions. I, these are good. Um, he has no ownership. We just paid that off in a year and then we were good to go on that. Um, it is 50-50. We, so we make the exact same amount of money. Eventually, if like I want to step back a little bit, um, we would keep like our owner's draws the same and my wage would decrease or something like that. Um, but in terms of the business, we are 50-50. Somebody once told us that we should go 49-51, but don't, I think that's the worst idea ever. <laughs> okay, hello. As someone who's studying like dance and enterprise leadership and like arts entrepreneurship, I was just kind of wondering like what your best advice is about like combining dance with business, especially when so many people ask like, how is that gonna work? And like, you get those kinds of questions. Um, good question. Hey, don't hurt my enrollment, by the way. So I, I'll try not to. I'll, I'll try yeah. not to. Um, I would say the biggest thing is just know what you want. Like, we got questioned a lot. And a lot of people said, like, like, and nothing against the dance department, but in the dance department, a lot of people are going to be professional dancers. And that was just not the track um, for us. But a lot of times we lied. I was like, yeah, I'm going to be a professional dancer. <laughs> Um, so like a lot of times we would lie about it, um, but we knew deep down, like this is what we want to do. And then in terms of like the entrepreneurial program, I think that's where we were a little bit confused sometimes was just like, oh, we need something differentiating. We don't necessarily have that. Um, so we would like make some things up sometimes, um, just to like satisfy questions. But at the end of the day, I think as long as you truly know, like what you're going after, and where you're headed, it doesn't really matter. Just like, just truck, truck on. So as a general rule, either in the personal realm or professional realm, just generally, what do you look for in a partnership? You want me to go again? Go. Okay. Um, I think the best thing to look for in a partnership is somebody who is a go-getter. Um, somebody who you can trust, somebody who you know will stick with you thin, through thick and thin. Um, Are you done? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just waiting. Like, no, go for it. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then the other thing I was going to say is values is such a huge thing. Um, we, I don't know how this happened. I, like, we just fell together and yeah. went for it. Um, but now we've gone through a lot of coaching and we know that our values are very similar. There's some of our top values that don't quite align, um, but just that we're aware of them. I think going into a partnership with somebody, I would be, I would say like, we need to sit down and we need to do a values test and we need to know what our values are and see if you're fine with it. Because at the end of the day, it is a marriage. And like, just because she isn't conservative with money like I am, I have to be okay with that because I chose to go into a partnership with her. And just because I'm not willing to work 24 hours a day because I can't handle that personally or I'll go crazy, she has to be okay with that and handle it. And so it's just getting everything out on the table of these are, these are the things that I stand by. These are my values. Family comes first. I have to be home at five o'clock. Sorry, that's what it is. Um, and then just being able to either accept that or if you know, like, I can't accept that because I'm a workaholic. I can't handle you taking time off. Um, then it's not going to work. It won't work. Um, so I would just say values is huge. Okay. And if I could ask a follow up to that, it seems like there's a lot of balance between you two. Like I see a lot of kind of mirrored image stuff with, depending on the scenario, right? Someone having doubts, someone not, family or mm -hmm. whatever. How did you two kind of? change each other or what did you learn from each other through your partnership um i think it has just been a lot of learning i think coming straight out of college at 21 and 22 and never taking a break to really like f 
figure out, figure it all out. Um, we've we've done it through fighting, um, and so it's just been a lot of okay. Why why are we having this conflict? What do we do now? Um, and then through all of that, we have really learned, okay, it is great that we are opposite in these areas because it does balance the business out. I have this perspective, you have this perspective. How can we meet in the middle and what is best for the business? And I would just follow up with, like, she's very competitive and I realized early on, I wanted to run the competition program. I fully, like I still to this day, that is something that I would enjoy doing. However, I know she is more passionate and when it comes to like family long term, like I would rather be home with my family and she can be at the competitions. But like we realized that through fighting and at first it was a huge source of conflict, but now we've been able to capitalize on it. This will be our final question for tonight. Okay, final question. I'll only ask one of the two then. Um, what, like overall, what do you think is like the biggest lesson that you learned from like the John Papa John Entrepreneurial Center that like helped get you from like 21, 22 years old starting your business to like where you are now? We didn't plant that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well first of all, I wanna hear your second question. Um, but I would say, I don't necessarily know if it's a lesson, but it's being surrounded by like-minded people. Um, and for me, I would have thought about biz like opening a business for, pro like I probably, I wouldn't have opened it. Like I wouldn't have opened it yet, it wouldn't have happened. But being like drugged by her and surrounded by people um, in the entrepreneurial center who are doing it, it, it just gave me the courage to take the step. So I would just say like the community environment. And then um, my second question, do you think being 21 and 22 years old when you started your business um, kind of limited like or gave you more options when it came to like your clientele for your business? I think it helped us and it hurt us. Um, I do think a lot of people came to us because we were young, fresh, new, um, and there had been the same dance studios in that, in that town for 20 years. Um, but at the same time, we also got told multiple times, you're only four years older than my oldest daughter, you don't know what you're doing, um, which, True, I was only four years older, but I did have a college degree. I did know what I was doing. Um, and that's where the partnership is very valuable because those things hurt. Um, and when you have somebody to bounce that off of, it's a little bit easier to handle. Um, and so we grew through that and I think we're sitting in a much better place. Um, but yeah, helpful and hurtful. Yeah, and now we're 25, so everyone thinks we're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you both for coming tonight. I think this, you know, it's, it's so refreshing to hear from young people that have, you know, the traditional path is not go to college, go start a company. And there are a lot of people, a lot of alums and people I work with all the time, they're like, students should not start businesses. They're not capable of starting businesses. Uh, and it's like, well, actually it depends on the person and it depends on the opportunity and it depends on, do they have people that they can trust? Do they have an opportunity that they, and that they can specialize in? and they're an expert in. And so I, I will tell you, I've been in this job and in this space a long time. And I have seen business plans that were home runs. And Joe, Joe you've seen these, so you think this is a winner and it failed miserably. And then you saw business plans, it's like, you've got to be kidding. This has no chance on, the, on the, this earth to work. And then you read about them that they just closed on $100 million financing. And so even the people that, through JPAC and people in the community, we're not gonna, while we, we have an experience and we have insights, we're not 100% we're not right. And you can't, it's sometimes hard to tell passion and desire and people, you know, a lot of this is about, I'm not going to fail. I'm gonna do what it takes to be successful, whatever, you know, whatever I need to do, and you'll, you will be successful. The biggest challenge I see with Hawkeyes is your lack of self-confidence. Right, when you're an entrepreneur, you might have, you might be unsure of things, but at the end of the day, you gotta believe in yourself. You gotta believe you're gonna land on your feet, right? And that's why you're here, and when you graduate from the University of Iowa, you're gonna be part of the chosen few, about 35 to 40% of adults in this country that will have a college degree. You're gonna be better prepared than I certainly was when I came out at the University of Iowa. Uh, and the world is in front of you to grab and take it, 
these two knew what they wanted for a long period of time and went on a path and now they're living the dream. And I always try to tell my students, live the life you imagine. And tonight we're thrilled that we've got Annika and Amanda here because they're living the life they imagined. Let's give them a big round of applause for being here tonight. Thank you all, have a great evening, and go Hawks. Go Hawks.